evening. Thank you for joining us today for the exhibit Imago Mundi by artist Stephanie Bedwell. And thank you for coming to her lecture. And um, I'm very happy because this is our first exhibit in a new space, nearly remodeled space. And so it's been a lot of fun to be able to um, present this to our campus and our uh, San Diego uh, community. Um, last Friday, uh, the museum studies class was working, hanging the exhibit. I have about 15 students, all women. We have the only museum studies program here in San Diego. And Stephanie had been uh, in the gallery on Thursday. We had brought out all the sculptures and we were laying them out on Thursday. And so Friday we were ready to hang. And um, Michael Field, her husband, was helping us. And I had uh, these 15 beautiful women and the artists helping put together this show. And the imagery that was in the show was about these embryonic you know, uh, figures, uh, the idea of nesting, the idea of womb. And so I just felt it was, it was, it was a good match. Um, so in four hours, after climbing up and down the ladder to set up the lighting and putting up the show, we were done. And as I walked out of the gallery, I, know, I don't know if you noticed, there are, there's uh, crows in the exhibit. I walked out of the gallery at not the very top of the LRC, our library building, there was a big crow and it was cawing. So I thought that was a good omen for this show. <laughs> um, about, um, I, th I guess two and a half, three years ago, I went to a gallery in the gas lamp district and went to see an exhibit by Stephanie Bedwell. And um, I was very impressed with her use of materials, um, her themes that brought in uh, um, elements from nature, you know, bones and um, uh, branches, but gave it a completely new feel by her use of uh, color, the pinks, the golds, the iridescent, the fibers, and I just thought it would be a fantastic um, exhibit to bring to our students. And this was a couple of years ago, so we had a much smaller space. But last year we were discussing uh, having her come to Mesa, and we had to change uh, her show. And I think it was very uh, lucky that we did it for the opening of our new space because it gave her the opportunity to create this wonderful, large-scale, monumental works that still have that intimate feel to them. Um, I uh, think some of you are uh, students of Stephanie from Grossman College, so she teaches there. She graduated with an MFA from San Diego State University, and uh, she is not only an artist and a sculptor, but she also published a book of art and poetry called Crash Course. Um, we are thrilled to have her here today, and um, I really want students to not only be able to see the work, but also to learn from ar an artist what it's like to create work, because the process is so important. And uh, because of the theme of this show, and, and the remodeling of the gallery, I feel like it's like a birthing, you know? And so the life and death cycles that you see in the exhibit, uh, but also this idea of renewal and uh, the idea that by making art, we feel so much part of life. And so I'm gonna let her talk about the show and about her past work. And I wanna just thank so much Michael Fields for so, being so wonderful with us. And been helping us in, in our museum studies program and, um, and also I wanted to thank the museum studies class for all their hard work and also Pat Vine for helping me put together incredible shows and of course thanks Stephanie and here we are. Thank you. Alright, I love this picture. <laughs> So most people, or many people, don't really know what an Imago Mundi is. And to be quite frank, I didn't really know what one was either until I was searching for a title. 
for the show. And so I was searching through one of my favorite books about uh, symbolism, and I read this, you know, Amagamundi, and I realized what it is is a sacred image. And a sacred image uh, can be like a mandala, or literally translated, it's an image of the world. So like a mandala, it's in the making, the process is the importance. So you've heard about the Tibetan monks that make these mandalas and they'll spend um, hours and hours with these tiny grains of sand, you know, laying down this most beautiful, beautiful, ephemeral work of art. You know, and then some yahoo comes running through and kicks it all, you know, and everybody gasps in horror. And the monks are, you know, so it's fine. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> because it really is the process. And so a mandala is a way of um, ordering the individual to the cosmos. And so the reason I titled it, this show that is because for me the process of making art is a way of ordering myself as an individual to the cosmos. It's really about the process. Um, so it's my way of making my life more about metaphor, um, making my life less about laundry, brushing your teeth, making macaroni and cheese, uh, and you know, bringing in the spiritual aspects <laughs> and the ritual aspects uh, to my life. Um, so when you look at the work, you know, obviously they're all really organic, but there's also a lot of symbolism that's, that uh, is, um, has been in the work for a really long time. So I will show you some of the older pieces and you'll see some of these images have been around for a really long time, but they're also very archetypal. So these are symbols that we all recognize. So a lot of times people say, I don't know what it means, but I, you know, I recognize it. It feels familiar to me. And they are symbols, you know, like ladders, which are, you know, traditionally bridges that, uh, that um, bridge earth and the spirit. Um, there's, you know, these, these horn forms or cornucopias. There's bead forms, necklaces, which represent, you know, the individual beads. But, you know, when you put it together, it's the whole. Again, you know, that reoccurring theme of the individual and the whole. Um, but they also have kind of an archaeological uh, look to them. So they have both that organic, soft quality to them, but they also look, you know, like somehow they've been dug up. <laughs> and, you know, there's bones, there's this fetal image. And a lot of it comes from my childhood. And here's a picture of my father. And there's two major aspects, I would say, to why my work looks the way it does. And one is he was an archaeologist. So I grew up around bones. We'd go out on digs and, you know, I'd you know, pull up a bone and they'd say, oh, look at this. And everybody's like, oh, <laughs> it was a bone. You know, and I just saw that I was finding, you know, these people were searching for treasures in the dirt. You know, and that in itself is a great metaphor. You know, we often have to look for our own treasure, you know, through some of the stuff that, you know, we may not want to look through. <laughs> so we find our treasures in the dirt. So I have these, these images that I grew up with, you know, in books, and also this value of, um, you know, these archaeological finds. Um, and in addition, my father died when I was nine. And so I came up against death. I brushed up against death at a really early age. And so it's not, you know, like, it stayed with me in a sorrowful way, but in some ways it stayed with me in a really powerful way, in that I always know that life is temporal, life is ephemeral. So, you know, the question is, uh, the question that I've been, you know, really thinking about for a long time is, how do we live and love despite the fact that this is all temporary, and that despite the fact that, you know, what we love can go away quite easily. So I've got that archaeological reference, and then I've got that life and death reference, where I have images that represent both life and vulnerability and soft things, and then I've got the hard things, you know, the bones and, um, you know, images of death and perhaps foreboding, if you look at the crows. The other aspect is my mother. My mother illustrated all of these. So these, this is my father's book that he wrote, his archaeology book, and my mother, sitting over there, illustrated all of these drawings. You know, so I've got to say that in addition to raising three children and being a professor and uh, all the other things that she's doing, and, you know, at night she's illustrating these things. So I have a great work ethic, and I have to say <laughs> that I got that from my mother. You know, people say, you know, when did you make this? I went, oh, no, I just, <laughs> I just went home and made it. And so, you know, I've got that as an influence as well. But in my very early work, these things started cropping up. And I think the work has always really informed me. So I was very unconscious at 22, like most people are. 
And I just was in the sculpture department making stuff. And, you know, I would make stuff that kind of appealed to me. But when I look at this, you know, and I look at this, it's, you know, kind of obvious now. But all life is in retrospect. So I was creating images that were sacred to me, that meant something to me, and also creating the ritual around these things. So I never would just buy stuff and use it. I would always like make my own wax string, you know, and I'd just be for hours dipping string in wax, you know. And it gave my life meaning and created this sort of ritual aspect that I think I was really searching for. Um, you know, I would cast things, um, but always they would come out very bone-like. I made my own fossils, and again, fossils come from that idea of you know, digging up treasures out of the dirt. If you look at a geode, it's just a rock, and it's only when you cleave it in half that you find this beauty. And so I would just take clay stuff, and I'd, you know, roll it in dirt and paint it and dip it in kitty litter and just make these things just, you know, again, it was about the process of having so much fun. And then later, before the show, I'd crack them open, and I'd be like, oh, look at that. <laughs> but, you know, I, these are from books that were around my house in childhood. This was, like, from my father's books. And so I really was looking at imagery like this. You know, no wonder it shows up years later. Now, there's also metaphoric uh, reference. You know, if you look at metaphors, um, I'm very interested in Jungian psychology. If you look at metaphors for teeth, you know, they're the primal part of us, that part of us that won't be co-opted. It's that, that part that bites back, the part that says, no, I'm not doing that. And so I love the imagery of teeth. You know, they're also, they have to move over. Teeth often have to move over and shift, <laughs> you know, and we do too. Um, so I'll pick an image that means something to me metaphorically at the time, and a lot of times they relate to body. Um, and then I'll just start working with that image in terms of materials, in terms of, um, you know, just playing with the objects, and then bones as well. So there's an awful lot of bones in the sculpture. And then bones, you know, clearly they are referenced to death because this is what's left. This is all that's left. Uh, and this also is a picture that came out of one of my father's books. But I just was fascinated with um, the austerity of a bone. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing extra. There's nothing extraneous. Now, of course, my bones are pink because they're girl bones. <laughs> you know? And it took me a long time to have the nerve to use pink because I never wanted to, you know, not be taken seriously. And I, you know, did have a little bit of a princess thing that, you know, luckily I had my mother to you know, knock out of me. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> years later, now that I'm, you know, into my 40s, I can make pink bones and I can wear sparkly things and it's all right. I'm still, you know, well respected. <laughs> so um, I like the bones. I also like to use a lot of uh, sewing, like crocheting, knitting, you know, what would typically be considered women's work. Um, so work that's done with your hands. And part of that, I think, is just because I can do it at home. I can do it wherever. And it seems to me that you're, you know, you're knitting something. And that's also very metaphoric for you know, bringing things together. So there's a juxtaposition in a lot of the work between something that's austere, something that's um, kind of a sharp image, something like this that I ran across on my last camping trip. So I'm walking up, and we're uh, looking in the caves. And all of a sudden, you go, oh, 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 you know, because it's beautiful, it's ugly, it's, oh, you know, shocking. Oh. And I, <laughs> I think that's kind of how life is. You know, we have this push and pull constantly. And so, you know, clearly I'm going to, I can use that imagery. So uh, I think that ribs are a beautiful shape, but they're also very much, um, you know, the pared down, they're the, what is left. This piece, <laughs> Dry's piece. Um, really got me thinking about the idea of body and spirit. So this piece is called Core. And again, I started out using bones and drawing this bird head. And then I started thinking, well, what does the spirit look like? So here's the head, here's the bones. But above is a picture of maybe what that bird's spirit would be like. So I got thinking really about body and spirit. We have the internal and we have the external. And so a lot of the pieces in this series have to do with, you know, the external, you know, this pod shape, which represented our outside, uh, and then, you know, maybe what's on the inside. 
Uh, this piece, you know, it's so sweet. Don't be fooled. You get up close. I think Michael still has a scar from it. Um, it's just covered in pins, you know. And so there's that push and pull between uh, the body and the spirit. You know, something is, um, you know, externally quite soft, and yet it could be very soft. Uh, externally quite hard and vicious, and it can be certainly soft on the inside. This piece is lined with velvet, and so it has that juxtaposition and that, that again, that body and spirit. This is my favorite book. This is the book that I reach for every single day. It's my book of symbols. So when I have a dream, I reach for it. And I, I just, you know, like it. And I don't know whether these are symbols that really mean things or whether I'm just imbuing with it, imbuing what I, you know, I like that idea that I can make meaning out of something that, you know, not necessarily has a specific meaning. And I think in some ways it's just a form of play for me. But what it has become is a way for my art to inform me because I use these books of symbols to sort of interpret and make metaphor out of say a piece like this. So for example, when I made this piece I was having really bad back problems. So I, I just like it was seriously for five years I just had a horrible back ache and I you know was really it was kind of debilitating. And I made this piece and I started to think about what is this you know trying to tell me. And when I made it, I realized it was really difficult to balance. You know, it had three legs and it kept wanting to fall over. And I realized that this piece was about balance. And so, you know, I looked at it and thought, how does that inform my life? Well, duh, I was completely out of balance. You know, I'm doing things for everybody. I'm doing, you know, I'm working hard, doing all the good wife, good mother, good daughter, all those things. And yet, you know, I really wasn't taking time for myself. I wasn't taking time to connect with the essence, you know, really of who I am. So in that way, the making of art is very healing for me because it does connect me to who I am essentially, not just the roles that I play. So these, you know, I made the sacrum, you know, and I, I made it sacred by making it um, shiny. <laughs> <laughs> um, this piece is called Mending Kit. I made it after I had a car accident. I had a head-on collision. Uh, and I broke three bones in my hand. Now that's ironic for an artist. Uh, I had just finished everything. I had done absolutely everything. I thought, I finished the semester and I did everything and I, you know, managed the kids and I, you know, I just had it all, you know, and I'm coming home and it's bam. And what did I break? My hand, the one thing that I used to do absolutely everything. And so for eight weeks I was just like this, walking around because my hand was just completely broken. I couldn't make anything, so I had a personality crisis, as you can imagine. It was very, <laughs> I really did. Emotionally, it was like a, a major breakdown because I couldn't do anything that, that made me who I was. Um, and so, you know, after I finally get my hand rehabilitated and back, I made this piece because, you know, I had a lot of revelation about who I was and how I functioned because of that accident. And so this is like, this is mending kit. You know, sometimes things have to be broken to be mended. And so in my case, I certainly wasn't going to stop. I was efficient. I could do it all. You know, and it takes something, you know, really um, serious to stop me. So that's what this piece is about. And again, you know, you may not know the story, but you can still relate, you know, to the, to the bones. And I do a lot of drawings. Um, that are quicker, they're not, they don't take as long as a sculpture, and they're very informative. Again, this was all around the back pain. And uh, my yogini used to say, Stephanie, you run around like a cat with her tail up, you know. <laughs> she says, you wonder why your back hurts. And again, it was about balance, that I was just running around, not taking care of myself, not listening to my body. You know, so I do these drawings that meditate on those things. So they really are like meditations. Uh, and, you know, bones and hearts. And then sometimes you just do that drawing because <laughs> you don't know what else to do. So <laughs> and, you know, a lot of my self-portraits look really sad. Uh, and that's because when I'm happy, I'm out camping, I'm shopping, <laughs> I'm having a margarita. But when, <laughs> but when I'm sad, you know, and there's something wrong that's not working, that's when I go to the art. So, you know, like... Um, one of my favorite artists, Joseph Boys. I mean, he really felt strongly that art was a means of healing. And for me, it just clearly is a means for healing because I can go to the art, I can do a drawing, and the drawing can inform me about where I am in my life. And this piece, I mean, was a perfect example of this. I kept losing my voice. I'm a teacher. I kept losing my <coughs> voice. Like four times a year, I just couldn't be able to talk. I go, 
And I thought, what is going on? You know, I did this drawing, and it looks so sad, but I realized, you know, what was stuck in my craw. And what was stuck was this, that little image again, which is, you know, vulnerability, which is creativity. And it always comes back to me not attending to myself. You know, trying to be all those, those roles, taking care of the roles, but not attending to myself. So I love this drawing. Other people don't like it because it's painful to look at, but it was just such, you know, a relevatory drawing for me. So this takes me to 1984, which I find hilarious because, you know, I was not a particularly conscious 22-year-old. I was just doing stuff, but really not very deep thinking <laughs> um, about what I was doing. And yet this image showed up even back then. And so I think it, you know, I look back at it, you know, kind of with poignancy that even then my psyche was trying to speak to me. You know, myself was trying to dialogue with myself about, you know, these little creatures in terms of, you know, protecting them. I look at the craftsmanship and I think I'm oh, just sewing them up and spray painting them with aluminum, you know, but it's the same essence, that essence of vulnerability. This piece, I love this piece, it smelled horrible, but <laughs> it was um, covered, it was in one of those fetal forms, and uh, I covered it in uh, plaster and clay and all kinds of stuff, and threw it out in the backyard, and I didn't know it was going to mildew, but I brought it into the gallery and cracked it open, and it was just so beautiful, but it gave the whole gallery a certain ambiance. <laughs> But again, it's about internal and external. So I look at these pieces, I can tell where I was, who I was. This was the piece that I made right when I found out I was pregnant. It's like, oh, you know, there's that little baby. Um, and <laughs> sometimes I'll do writing on things. Um, but I really think that this fetal image represents vulnerability. It represents, you know, our essence. A lot of times people say, well, did you, did you lose a baby? And I think, yeah, maybe I lost myself. And again, you know, my father died early at that point. I really did step up to the plate. I, you know, in some way I lost my innocence. Um, you know, when we lose something, you know, it leaves a certain psychic wound. But that wound, you know, in some ways has become a healing uh, aspect for me. So these are all the babies, the various stages of the babies. And I like to sew them, sit in my living room and sew them. And one of my favorite things is now I have 15-year-olds. And so these big, lunkin 15-year-old boys, some of them I know, some of them don't, will come into my house and be like, dude, can I hold the baby? And I'll say, you want to hold the baby? I'm like, yeah, can I hug the baby? I'll say, are your hands clean? <laughs> Okay, you can hug the baby. And then uh, sometimes bird imagery has cropped up, and I really think the birds are, you know, metaphors for like the canary in the coal mine. You know, these are the creatures that, without help, you know, from the environment, they really perish. You know, and that's metaphoric of our spirit. You know, or our essence. Without help from ourselves, without support, you know, that quiet, soft part of us does perish. As a self-portrait. <laughs> and then hearts have just, you know, always been there. Um, you know, at some point I thought I might stop making them. Uh, Michael questioned me a couple of times, <laughs> but now, you know, it's given up. Uh, I think I'll probably keep making hearts for a long time. But what I like about this one is uh, the juxtaposition of this heart, the sweet, sweet spot that you might want to crawl into, and the bones. And that really represents that, um, that, um, uh, rubbing up against the life and the death, having to coexist side by side all the time. In order to love, we've got to know that there is death as well. And then this piece is called Home Regardless. I, I often leave, you know, the mending. I leave the stitches. And, you know, when you're young, you think you're going to go from point A to point B, and you're going to do it, you know, in a very linear fashion. And as we age, we understand that these tangents, these, these wrong turns, these missteps, those perhaps, you know, those are inevitable, and perhaps they could be our beauty. They can be our depth. And so this piece is beautiful because of the wounds, because of the... Um, you know, the, the imperfections, you know, so thinking about how we can honor our imperfections instead of viewing them as something that we've done wrong, that this is our depth. So these are a series of hearts. This 
This one has cat wool in it, harvested by my son. <laughs> he combed the cat, here mom, I've got cat wool for you. <laughs> so great. I didn't know you could have cat wool, but it's in that piece. <laughs> so sometimes I'll pull um, journal, you know, I always journal, I always write. Sometimes I'll pull those pages. And I, I like that idea of taking, you know, that mundane stuff that we write, you know, that whiny stuff that goes in the journal. <laughs> <laughs> and pulling it out and making something of value of it. So a lot of the bases have stitches. Uh, sometimes I just sew on top of rocks. So I'll find a nice rock and I'll put velvet over it and I love how it's uh, just heavy. Um, this one is set into plaster. This has cattail fuzz in it, which is a beautiful thing, cattail fuzz. <laughs> and then this series, um, this if I could hold my head in my heart, um, you know, really represents if we could think with our heart you know, the world would be spared a lot of grief, you know, and that's on a global scale, but, you know, on an individual scale, if I could think with my heart, you know, and not necessarily my brain, uh, you know, remaining in touch with my intuition and my soul, then I'm usually in a better place. So these are, this heart is actually in the show. And then this I wanted to show you because I really, you know, one of the things that I love about art making is that it's a form of integration for me. So this is my backyard. And, you know, I'm not making art in a studio that's separate from my house. I'm not making art separate. separate. I love this photo. Michael takes fabulous pictures of me. <laughs> that's why I usually, they're usually like this when I'm going, no! Um, but this is our living room. And, you know, the fact that, that I have a life where there's no objection to the to the amount of stuff that's in my living room. You know, it's a real blessing to me. Um, you know, nobody ever says, <laughs> why are there uh, 600 feet of entrails in the living room? It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just people step over them. I mean, sometimes my children complain. Um, but I really like making art in my home. I don't want to be separate. And I like making it, you know, with the children around and the TV's on. It's not like it's this separate, you know, it's such a spiritual activity that it has to be separate, you know. It is such a spiritual activity that it's together, it's integrated, it's, it's all together. And then, of course, every now and again I have to call on my girlfriends when, <laughs> there's Nan over there, when I can't sew one more length, I said, get out your needle, sister, come on. <laughs> I got a bottle of wine. Over. So, and there's, these are all the children, these are all the shaghead children watching some stupid thing on television. And there we are sewing. And, you know, it just makes it a really happy experience for me. Um, I really like that idea of mending, bringing things together, whether it's physically mending something or whether it's pulling together community. Uh, and then, <laughs> of course, when I bring home new materials, it's like, you know, when you bring something new into the monkey cage, this... <laughs> <laughs> this is my son. <laughs> and this is my older son about to pounce on my other son. And this is me trying to make something. <laughs> and this is our garage. Yay! <laughs> so it's one thing, you know, to make this stuff. Um, and it, I gotta say, I'm just so happy when I make stuff because. You know, there it is, and I don't have to answer to anybody, and, you know, I made this cool thing, and I had this great time. Um, but there's another aspect of this, and this is taking it out into the world. And so this part has been really interesting for me, and it's forced me out of my comfort zone in some ways. But the female aspect of ourselves, you know, nurtures, it creates, it makes. And then the male aspect has got to take that stuff out to the gallery. <laughs> you got to strap it on your car and out it goes. And so this really was the part that was a little harder. So we get to the gallery and I got to say that this was a, a wonderful part of this whole process because I got there, you know, and as far as I was concerned, I made this stuff, you know, just put it in the gallery. Now people assumed I knew what I wanted and people assumed that I knew where things were going. And I assumed that it would somehow all come together, but I really, really didn't know. Uh, and so working with people and having, you know, 15 lovely women 
and it was just a great experience. Say, so what are you doing with this? And I would say, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, and I'd usually kind of try and get close to Michael. So Michael, what, are we <laughs> what, what was the plan with this over here? <laughs> and so, you know, I realized that it, I didn't really have to know. And so this was an evolution in itself. And so I would say, well, I was thinking about this. And then people would kind of put things together and we would look at it and decide whether it needed to be changed or not. Um, but working with people and kind of letting go of the outcome, you know, it's kind of like having children. You can only raise them so much and then you gotta let go of it. Um, so I would tell somebody, well, I want this like that and they would do it and I'd come back and I'd look at it and it wasn't at all how I envisioned it, but it was wonderful. And so to um, experience that was very new for me and really enjoyable. So you can see the uh, exhibit sort of coming together from an empty gallery and then people lighting it and people getting excited about it. It was really, really nice. And I realized I can't just sit home making stuff anymore because this is fun too. And there it is. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>